It's Paul Ruse here from Performance by Design and welcome to the Culture Couch uh, with my partner in crime as usual, Jared Murphy. G'day Murph. G'day Ruse, how, how are you? you? Uh, exciting day today. We've got Stephen Lester, the current Managing Director of Nissan Australia and New Zealand. And just quickly, Steve, before I bring you in, spent a lot of time with BMW in Canada, grew up in Canada. We're going to start with that. And then was the Managing Director in Infinity from 2014 to 2017. But you also had a stint with BMW in Munich as well. So. First question is probably more around the cultures of the different countries. I mean, did you notice a big change coming from Canada, Munich for a while, back to Canada, and then over to Australia? Yeah, great question. I mean, without a doubt, <laughs> massive difference uh, in the countries. And I'm you know, probably very, very lucky having uh, had that experience. Um, also at a pretty young age where uh, you're, you're, you're very uh, open-minded um, and absorbing everything. And I think you know, when you come from Canada, which is very similar to Australia. Mm. I think that, you know, I, I wouldn't have necessarily said that before I had the chance to live here, um, but you can certainly see how similar the two countries are. Uh, Germany relative to Canada, even relative to Australia, also very different, highly structured, um, culturally very different in terms of also the personal relationships, the mm. interpersonal um, side is not nearly as casual. It's mm. It can be very intense or, um, very distanced, yeah. right? Which is which is really interesting, especially in a work environment where you're getting either to know people really, really well, better than you ever expected, mm. um, lifetime friends that we've got from our time there, um, to people um, that you didn't really get along with, and yet actually they really liked you, yeah. even though <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. You know, whereas I think here in Canada, in Australia, the same thing. I mean, it's it's a yeah. little bit more casual yeah. uh, in that regard, and the work environment tends to be a little bit. What about, well. what about growing up in Canada? Like all of us, you would have had your role models and I'm sure family background played a mm. big part of it, sport played a big part of it. So some of, some of your role models as a young fella growing up. Sure. Um, I think it starts, you know, very much a, a, a nurture uh, kind of believer. Um, and so with my parents and, and the upbringing that I had with them and, and our extended families um, was very, very strong. And um, often oriented around that uh, believing in yourself and, and um, a lot of sport, um, some music in there to really help um, build that self-confidence. Um, and so I think as, as role models, I had two really hardworking uh, parents who were great examples to me of what, you know, determination and, and adversity and, and overcoming things uh, can do for oneself. And, uh, and that sort of spawned, I had some really great coaches growing up um, yeah. as a kid, some really- What, what sport did you play? Uh, like I tried, to, I tried everything. Yeah. I probably wasn't that good at any of them, yeah. but uh, you know, I loved to, loved to play, uh, play sport and whatever I could uh, compete in and, and get behind. What was your favorite? Come on, you've got to give um, us some. <laughs> oh, look, I, I played baseball probably um, as most competitively as I, as I, I could have that. Um, at that time. Um, uh, but I loved, you know, played uh, gridiron and basketball yeah. and skied and played hockey and all sorts of things. But even, so. even that from a cultural point of view in, mm -hmm. in Canada, because we would recognise Canada as an ice hockey yeah. sort of st country, really. So not necessarily choosing another sport, because like all kids, you play different sports. Yeah. But did you feel a touch of alienated as a baseball player in, in, in Canada? That's a great question. I haven't exactly forgiven my parents for that, <laughs> uh, but that's, I think, a, another couch we'd have to sit yeah. on to address those yeah, topics. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 where I grew up in Thunder Bay was a completely hockey mad mm. uh, city, and uh, and I only played very recreationally. So, uh, and I, you know, the, the, uh, the appetite for hockey from my parents wasn't very high to be at the rink at 5, 5.30 yeah, in the okay, morning. Okay. Uh, yeah freezing and yeah. and uh, and getting uh, getting uh, your skating on and and uh, and playing competitively it's a tough tough culture yeah. um, to get behind there but um, you know that being said it was uh, you know sport I just really enjoyed and again you know my parents my father spent a lot of time playing catch with me and those sorts of things and yeah. something that I get to enjoy now doing even with my son and um, you, you realize just how much that builds you you up. So even here in Australia, actually going out with my son to kick the footy around, yeah. Yeah. things I would have never thought I would be doing today. But man, <laughs> we get you know we have so much fun out of that. And if he grows up and decides footy's the thing for him, then great. I mean, how is your wouldn't push him in any particular direction? How is your kicking? Because it's not it's a it's a very specific <laughs> skill kicking yeah. Aussie rules football. Um, 
I could definitely use a lot of help. So if you know anybody who's been any good at footy, um, you know, I could definitely use some coaching. I think getting, um, um, it's a humbling experience when your seven year old uh, is, is, uh, is out kicking you. But um, you know what, I've, uh, I've, I've grown, I've got to learn and, and apply myself if I want to get better. What, what about business leader role models? So mm-hmm. when you first started at BMW, mm-hmm. did, did you have a, had you made a conscious decision at an early age that you wanted to be a leader, wanted to be a managing director? Was it just a matter of getting into a company as a young person and naturally learning? Mm-hmm. Well, I think um, sport played a lot in that, in the context, and, and you know this obviously very well of you know being in a team and being yeah. a part of something. It's not always the best player or the smartest person who ends up being the leader in any mm. circumstance. Yeah. It's mm. it's the person who is most often able to take some of those uh, strong leadership values um, and is able to rally people, convince them in achieving uh, a particular goal. And uh, I've been on teams where I've definitely been a, a role player and I've been on teams mm. where I've been uh, a leader and I've been on teams where I've definitely not been the best, and I've been on fortunate to be on a couple of teams where I've probably been one of the, the better players. Mm-hmm. But in all of those circumstances, mm-hmm. you learn about that interpersonal piece. So when you take that into a business environment, um, you start to realize it's the exact same. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it, the, the 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 locker room is is the exact same as as the water cooler and the lunch room and all those sorts of things. And meetings are the same mm-hmm. way. Your your coaches, you know, um, would would take you in after the game or at halftime or quarter time, or whatever, and and, and, and have a performance discussion, right? And, yeah. and, and it's in real time, yeah. right? And, and we do that today in, in business and in every, exactly the same yeah. ways. And so. so how old were you when you actually started to realize that? So it sounds like you've worked through that at quite a young age as you're coming through sport, mm-hmm. that, that leadership isn't necessarily going to a particular person, but yeah. you can actually take that on. When did, when did you realize that? Um, I don't know that, it, that I ever, I guess really realized yeah. it as much as it just sort of evolved into mm. sort of a behavior and, and series of actions. I mean, I think it's tough to go in and maybe a great question for you is, you know, in, from the teams that you've played on, when did when did you decide that you were going to be a leader mm. on that team versus did it yeah. just happen? And all of the things that came around you really then said, hey, oh, you, you, you don't get, you can't anoint yeah. yourself. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing. I was having a conversation the other day around sport and how important sport is for young kids. Because mm-hmm. we were talking about the impact of COVID on junior sport. Mm-hmm. And we were saying the things that you pick up in sport are incredibly invaluable. And I think your point, Steve, is it, it's not necessarily make a, a conscious decision. It's actually what you're picking up, what you're seeing, what you're yeah. watching. And that's fundamentally what we talk about culture, isn't it? It's not necessarily what's on a wall when you walk into a wall. It's what you're seeing. So to have that background is really important. What were some of the moments in your early business life that you you felt were really challenging? That you mm-hmm. felt, I had to dig into those sort of moments when I wasn't the best player or, or when I mm-hmm. was the best player. Was, was there some moments early on when you in your early 20s, mid 20s that you sort of had to really reach into that or you, you thought, I get it or hang on, I don't get it? Well, it's a good question, I guess. Um all the way along, I've been challenged by some really good managers. That's probably you know one of the things that I've been really fortunate about, and I talk to employees about this is, um, you know, you can make your own um, destiny in, in a lot of ways um, if you choose the right path when the path is presented to you, and and yep. everybody mm. has that opportunity to go right or left yep. or zigzag, um, and. Through some of the good managers that I, I had uh, growing up, especially young in my career, just gave challenges out. And to answer your question, you got that sink yeah, or swim, yeah, yeah. you know, opportunity. And yeah. and sure enough, some you, you had to sink. I mean, mm. if if you didn't, either you're not really being challenged, yeah. or you're not yeah, reaching yeah. far enough. I mean, there's 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 no question about that in in my mind. But it's it's how you recover from that and and reapply yourself. And I think I always had the benefit of of managers who acted like coaches in the sense that, you know, they helped pick you back up, mm. they dusted you off, they helped show you what the problem yep. or where things may have gone wrong, and then they gave the problem back to you. Yeah. And so yeah, 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 yeah. now you go back and, and mm. you get out there. And and that's where I think good managers, leaders, executives, coaches, you know, however you want to 
um, categorize those people with a title, that's what the most successful people yep. do. Yep. You know, it's not always an autocratic, you know, dictatorship because there's very few environments where that can be successful. Yeah. Right. They must so. have seen some attributes in you, though, that that enabled them to feel comfortable in challenging you and mm -hmm. stretching you. So take that to you now. What what are the attributes that you look for in the in young people where you <laughs> say, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to invest my time in that yeah. person? rather than, uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, th the one thing that I look for is the willingness to do the other things that, that, that others don't do. So, and, and that is, that, that can take <laughs> so many forms. Um, it's not just, do you sit in the office from, you know, all hours, you know, are yeah. you a seven to 10, you know, 15, yeah. 16 hour a day kind so of person. Have you, have you got an example? So but are you really, are you really getting into those problems? So, you know, when they hear, when you hear questions getting picked up or asked in meetings, do you have people that actually, rather than just hearing the question and thinking, oh, I've, 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 I've asked this to, to Ruzi, is Jared actually going off then and helping solve that yeah. problem, even yeah, though yeah, they're yeah. independent yeah. of maybe the mm, question yeah. that was being asked, you know, are they, are they seeking out opportunities to engage with people that could offer some support to them? You know, I think back, I, I never missed a single opportunity to talk to a senior person. Fantastic. Yet you wouldn't believe the amount of times that we would have skip level meetings or, or larger group settings where people will go, mm, actually, I kind of want to do something else. Yep. So yep. it's been great talking to you, yeah. but you know, <laughs> I'll go do something else. That's your learning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, where, mm. that's where you really get a, a chance. I mean, how many times did you ever skip as a kid growing up playing footy a chance to kick with one of the senior players? Mm. I mean, I bet you it was never. Well, I think that, again, we talk about role models as well, isn't it? It's what, what you see, and I was really fortunate through that period to have guys that just turned up. I mean, mm. just turning up is effectively what you're saying. Yeah. Just turn up and yeah. help Murph. Mm -hmm. Just turn up. Even if you don't know what to do, just walk into his office and say, mate, I know Steve asked you to do that. Do you need a hand? Mm -hmm. it, it's often just the ability to, to be there. Yeah. And I think too many people just don't turn up because there's mm -hmm. this little fear of what about if Murph says he doesn't need help or, or what about if he's mean to me or something mm -hmm. like that. So I think your analogy is for me when I look think of it, just turn up. Just help people. Put your hand up. They'll tell you whether they need help or they don't need help. But if you don't turn up, yeah. it makes it really difficult. I want to follow on a bit from what Murph's saying, though, is what were some of the things that you felt you didn't get? You've jumped up to managing director mm -hmm. in Infinity before you came over yep. to Australia. What did, what did you feel like you hadn't received mm -hmm. and you weren't ready for as the, the managing director or coach or CEO, yeah. whatever you wanted to call it? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a great question, a, a story that, that we've had the discussion on. I think the funny thing is uh, you have to be prepared for not knowing the things yeah, you yeah. don't know. Mm. Um, and, and we had a great story because we've worked with, uh, with you guys for a while. Yep. And, and uh, we were talking about um, this uh, joking in the culture mm. um, and really applicable to our team was the first time uh, we sort of got some of yeah. this out on, onto the table. Um, and wasn't that I wasn't prepared for anything. It was that I wasn't prepared that I wasn't asking the right questions or trying to yeah. unearth mm. the right problem. And, and this sort of really epiphany moment came when we were standing <laughs> um, in our CFO's office and, and we were doing this, this 360 review with the team. And, and Jared says, did you ever think that the, the, the kind of joking, you know, is, is disruptive? Mm. And I, and it was this, <laughs> I've misread the culture. Yeah. I've misread how it should be. I've looked at this from, uh, this is what I inherited. Rather challenging it, mm. I went along with it and yeah, supported right. it. Mm. And as a consequence, I was enabling. Yep. Yep. And it was profound the impact that that immediately yep. had when we put the brakes on and, and really shifted gears. And answering your question, what I didn't know coming into that or was a, what I wasn't prepared for was another scope or set of diverse problems or challenges that I needed myself actually to actually sit back and reflect <coughs> more on. And I think that's what's made me uh, uh, better in that sense is being more open. It's not just a commercial decision or problem that you're trying to solve. There's a much more 
um, intricate yep. uh, challenge when it comes to people and culture, that understanding how you're um, shaping it, challenging it, yep. what you need to do um, to, to help uh, change that. And so I love, the, I love the, the, the story's a great story because it almost embodies everything we talk about, yeah. culture, is it, where you, you said you, you, you came out to Australia, you went to a barbecue and a couple mm-hmm. of social occasions, everyone's making jokes, using mm-hmm. banter, yep. Yep. Mm. rock up to work, we're doing the same at work. And so for you, that was like how Australians did business. Mm-hmm. And, and we talk about culture being the behavior that's, that we accept or reward. So for you, that, that's, that's how it works. Mm-hmm. And, and then it just becomes what exists yep. and people just accept it. Yep. And so it's not until you step out and go bang, What's going on here? Yeah. That you realize shit, this isn't probably perfect. Yeah, and and the and the discussion I think that we had stemming out of that was um, the appropriateness of it. So the and and by context was timing in that sense. And and this was where you know we actually were getting along as a group, yeah. but it was becoming unproductive in certain contexts. And and that's where that really helped um, move that along really quickly down the uh-huh. downstream for us. Yeah. And, and move things along. So for me, it was, and the other thing too is, you're not always perfect. Like, and, and the, the uh, even though you have an idea that things are going uh, good or bad or well, um, you can always make it better. Yeah. And that's where I think really that just being, again, remembering that open-mindedness, lifelong learner, um, those things then yeah. become invaluable in terms of instilling the, the culture you want to have. Because I agree, they're, they are what we reward, and they're your actions, yeah. right? And yeah. that those actions, um, you know, for for um, unfortunately, in in certain circumstances, of course, dismantling a culture can happen mm. oh, yeah. all too quickly, yeah. um, and it takes a lot longer um, to to build it back up. So, what what about? I mean, COVID just hit us out of the blue, so mm-hmm. no one was prepared for it, yeah. regardless of what position, what industry, or what. Um, yeah, family, community, mm-hmm. whatever. But certainly the, the car industry was just, you know, just bang. It was mm-hmm. sort of like, what the hell is happening? Take us through the initial stages of that for, as the managing director and, and mm-hmm. how confronting, because you've got to deal with your own personal circumstances, you've then got to run a, a company. So there's so many things going through your mind. So take me through the, the sort of days leading up to when we mm-hmm. all realised how, how serious it was. Mm-hmm. What did it look like for you? Oh, it's a great question. I think yeah, there's going to be an awful lot of books written on on uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of, yeah. of yeah. corporate um, action and reaction to it. Um, you know, for us, very early on, um, we wanted to um, you know focus on on the three areas that are most important: our, our people and and their health individually, um, our our customers and their needs as well. Because what's what's lost is that while we uh, everything kind of stopped. We still had customers that needed service on their vehicles mm-hmm. or needed assistance yeah. from us in a variety of ways. So that always had to be there at some level and we had to figure out some solutions for handling that. And then of course our dealers. We've got 181 dealers across mm. uh, the country um, whose businesses and livelihood and financial, personal financial stake is is at risk. So we needed to go, you know, into those three areas and, and look and dissect a plan for each one of those groups of how we would do it. And um, I, I would say, to be perfectly honest, regardless of, of political discussions, I think the government's handled very swiftly mm. things mm. that needed to be done and in the right way. And I think Australians as a, as a country, as a nation, you know, deserve a lot of credit for culturally how quickly we adopted and adapted to the change and looked out for one another. Mm. You know, that, that notion of mateship, yeah, I yeah. think, yeah. Is, Good point. Yeah. is, mm. is um, you know, really something that is, is, is impressive. And, uh, you, you know, think we did it better than other countries? I in absolutely terms do. Of the, you do? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, th- there will be a lot of hemming and hawing over the economics yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, people yeah. will yeah. always bring biases into that conversation. Yeah. But when you think of, in relative terms, how few people have, have unfortunately uh, passed away, yeah or how quickly the transmission has been mitigated. Mm. Uh, across a country this vast, 24 million people, yeah. it's, it's, it's not a small place either. Um, it's really impressive. Yeah. And you know, it's, I, I, I really hope that economically that everything comes out really well on, on the other side for everybody, of course. Um, 
but I think it's been impressive just how quickly um, yeah. uh, it's been done. And 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 I think um, I know we don't necessarily call them citizens of, Aus of Australia, but you know Australians um, deserve a lot of credit for for self. I want to pick that up that on stuff. one of the points because we, we talk about it. every organization, every sporting club. Culture is everywhere. So I want to pick up on your point mm -hmm. about mateship because it's mm -hmm. interesting, like as a Canadian coming to mm -hmm. Australia, like Canada has a culture, Australia has yeah. a culture. So extrapolate on that a little bit. What does that look like for you? Because what we talk about is what does that behaviour look like? Because it's a really interesting point. We probably take it for granted and, mm -hmm. and being Australians, it's I was a bit like you, man. Oh, wow, that's a an interesting, we've done it so well because we can micro, we can pull it all apart and say we could have done that better, we could have done that better or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd like you to extrapolate on that. What and did it look like for you, that notion of mateship from a behavioural point of view? And, uh, and with that, is mateship different in Canada than yep. it is in Australia? Um, yeah, so I'll start there. I think um, it is it is different in the context of uh, maybe how Aus Australians are or see themselves um, within the globe. So it's obviously yep. a continent. It's also an island. Yep. And it's far away yeah, yeah, yeah. from other things. Mm. And it's a very harsh climate, right? Yeah. And and so there is an inherent sense of self-preservation that has to happen in here. Yep. And I think that okay. causes people to That's believe and yeah. look out for one another. Yeah. Because, you know, if, if we dropped us in the you know, the, the red center, I mean, the likelihood of survival is uh, very, very slim. Yeah. Um, and, and so there is, there is an inherent ruggedness and toughness, right? And, and you see that in the outback, you see that in a lot of the things, the way we look at, at uh, Australia, even in the colloquial yep. sense, of course. But I think also inherent in that is that people actually genuinely want to look out for each other. Yep. They okay. look out for their neighbor, you know? How many, you, you didn't really hear a lot. You heard a few, but not a real lot of people who were trying to circumvent yeah. the government's uh, regulations. Yeah. You didn't hear a lot of people trying to stand up against the, mm. the government or yeah. against um, law enforcement to say that we're being unfairly or that this isn't. Because people, I think, genuinely believed and trusted the advice, the guidance, yep. Yep. that was being given and mm. they felt the need to make sure that they looked out for you and yep. you and me and and everybody else because that's how we all get on and i think in in canada you see a lot the same way at also like australia very culturally diverse um also a lot of sharing also a lot of generosity um kindness but there is still more of an influence of 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 probably some other uh countries from from a canadian uh perspective and, and you can kind of see that, especially because Canada sits so much on the border um, with yep. the U.S. So there's still a lot influenced yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there through North America. And they're not nearly as disconnected uh, from a geographical standpoint. So you would have got a good sense of that, I guess, colloquialism, Australianism with the number of dealerships you've got because mm -hmm. they're quite diverse, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So is that something you picked up as well through those conversations you were having throughout the, the network in Australia? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you can certainly see the difference between a rural and a, yep. and a metro dealer and just how rural rural is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's yeah. you, know, we, we, you know, I joke about actually growing up in the middle of nowhere, kind of eight hours between yeah, yeah, two yeah. different cities, right? Um, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, some parts of WA, Northern Territory, mm. et cetera, and even, even Queensland are, are extraordinarily far. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, our, our dealers, in, in terms of our activities, especially COVID-related, we're oriented around how do we help? How do we put an arm around them yep. to let them know that it's going to be okay? How do we engender that um, mateship ideal to say, look, we're going to be here. We're going to look out for you. We're going to hear the things that we're going to either do or stop doing or change to, to make sure that, that we help and, and see us all, all through this. And I think internally that reverberates through the organization where they say, hey, it's not just commercial decisions, mm. it's not just black and white, where we are actually, as a company, looking out in the broader sense. So we were very cognizant of communicating with our employees about the things we're doing for customers and the things we're doing for dealers, and very cognizant with those groups as well, of talking to them about the other groups in terms of what we're doing and how we can and, uh, and support pe them. People see that, Steve, don't they? They, <clears throat> they understand that you. it's not just about selling a car, mm -hmm. that it's an investment in the relationship and an investment in the in the business and the people that run the business. Mm -hmm.
and that spreads, I think, mm -hmm. through throughout the network. So uh, it it then um, allows them to commit further back to you. Mm -hmm. Have you found that? Um, yeah, we, I mean, we, we've certainly seen in the last um, you know month the dealers um, accelerating their businesses back to life in yeah. a lot of ways because they now um, uh, believe not only you can see it in the numbers, but you know they actually believe, hey, yeah. they're going to look out. You know, they're going to do these right things. They're not going to end up. You know, you always have, uh, you know, inventory discussions with dealers, and they're not just going to get slammed with a bunch of cars or something like that. They're going to look out for us in in the broader sense, and so that's really, you know, been been key uh, to us. I think um, getting our dealers um, on side and getting our employees. I think what we will find is really back into the swing a lot quicker than we'd maybe earlier thought. But I'm, I'm interested maybe, um, Rizzi, for a question from you, going back to that mateship. Um, in, in your teams, how have you seen, you know, especially on all the teams that, that you played on, um, what were some of the best examples from how you brought teams together or how teams came together as, 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 uh, as one unit? Yeah, all I would talk about is creating like shareholders rather than employees. That's probably mm -hmm. the best analogy I try and make. And, and through what we were able to create at, at Sydney and then when I got to Melbourne, it, the more you involve people in the discussions, which mm -hmm. you do really well, they feel part of it. People want to go to work to feel valued, don't they? They don't mm -hmm. want to go to work or they don't want to go to a footy team to feel like, you know, shit. Yeah. It, it's they want to contribute. And I, I, in all my time in football and the sort of 35 years and the facilitators we had to come in and and the butcher paper that were written on the wall and the mm. days and all that sort of stuff. I think the key for me is when the players finally felt they were valued. Mm -hmm. Oh, our voice is now finally heard. And I can say that through the eyes of a player as well because I was captain of a footy club and I remember thinking, why don't I ask the question? I'm actually captain of this club and no one really wants to know what <laughs> I want my footy club to look like. And I think there's, there's multiple keys, but I think that's one of the big keys. Mm -hmm. Like how do you... How do you get your employees to really feel like they're in, invested in yeah. what we're collectively doing? I think that's the biggest part of it. And I think what you do and have done really well is just that. But I also think you're in a unique position too, because not only are you a managing director, but you're actually working with people that run their own businesses. So they're mm -hmm. leaders of, of their own businesses. Without giving names away, what have you seen through this period of really poor leadership and really good leadership? Again, mm -hmm. don't mention the dealership <laughs> and don't, don't mention the names, but you are in a unique position yeah. because not only are you running Nissan Australia, but you're obviously looking through mm -hmm. a, another lens as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Is there some really dramatic examples you've mm -hmm. seen through this period? Um, yeah, there, there certainly would be like in, in anything that yeah. you're going to do. And, and anytime you've got a group this size, you're always going to have you know, um, people on, on, on both ends of, of the spectrum. And I think, um, you know, commercially for us, what we see is, is um, the dealers who are uh, especially taking on uh, a challenge is breeding opportunity. Yep. Um, by far in a way, mm. moving down that successful uh, track um, quicker than, than others. The ones um, that unfortunately have, have made decisions um, you know, and then the circumstances are also complicated. So yep. it's not as easy as just saying, you know, treat everything like an opportunity yeah, 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 and yeah. run towards it and yeah. you'll be fine. Um, they haven't reacted as quickly and, and as a consequence have missed out on, on opportunity that's, yeah. that's been there. Yeah. And even though you keep saying it's there, it's there, it's mm. there, it's, you know, you miss it and then you, oh, I'll, I'll wait a little bit longer and then I'll jump, I'll get it the next time. You know, and, and unfortunately, we all know that opportunity yeah, just yeah. doesn't stick around and, and wait. So you've got to get in as, as quick as possible. Um, and I think yeah, by and large, though, our dealers have done a great job with their own employees and with sharing the information that we're getting out. Um, you know, we're, we're taking a lot of unique ways to, to contact and communicate mm -hmm. with dealers. I mean, it's, it's still a fairly, you know, antiquated visit. Your field rep shows up at the yeah. dealership. Yeah. They look through the PowerPoint deck. They yeah, look yeah, through yeah. the financials. You know, mm -hmm. they, they do some of those things. And today now we're, we're with in group chats on Zoom mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm popping in and out of each region to say hi to the yeah. dealers. and and to, to pump them up a little bit, talk about what's going on and, and how we're addressing things going forward. And and we're seeing our field staff also all of a sudden go, oh, wait a minute, the MD or the CFO's just hopped on the call and, and they've got a, 
also adapt their game mm -hmm. because they're not also used to having uh, senior people necessarily <laughs> yeah, watch yeah. <laughs> watch them um, in an un, un, uh, unprescribed sort of way. So so that part's been also uh, a lot of fun and and sharing those ideas and just saying to the dealers, hey, we've, we've taken this idea from Queensland and yeah. and it's worked out there and they've done a really <laughs> great job with it. How how can we do it in Victoria? So what are the what are the things that you'll take out of <coughs> COVID that you've learned in COVID that you'll take forward mm. that you won't. Yeah, we weren't doing that before, but that we can actually keep doing that because mm -hmm. I think businesses will take some, the successful business will take a lot of learnings and keep them mm -hmm. post COVID. Oh, 100%. I think that, um, uh, you know, you take, uh, <laughs> we're discussing this about work from home. Yeah. I think is going to be one of those things going to be with us for now for, for a while. But um, we, we talked early on, if we went to our IT team and we said, we're going to have the entire staff work from home next month. You know, what would you have said? They would have said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no way. way. I'll tell yeah. you what, 12, yeah. 18 yeah, yeah, months, yeah. we can we'll do it. Don't worry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we were less than 10 days, yeah. the entire mm. staff mobilized and everything yep. functioning. Mm. So absolutely everything that we were doing before was back up and, and running at, at full tilt, basically, of, based on the business coming in. Mm. And, and we weren't missing uh, a beat. And I think it was a really good reminder of what we can do. And when, you, when you're faced with a hurdle, mm. how you can overcome it um, and challenge yourselves um, to do uh, some really great things. Um, and I think that will be one of the things that carries forward with us, um, not just with us, and I don't think we'll have our staff home uh, yeah. entirely forever, mm. yeah. um, but I think we'll really learn um, uh, how to uh, address that working from home or how to do work differently, mm. utilizing um, obviously the tools at our disposal a little bit yeah. better and yeah. a little bit um, quicker. Um, and connected to that, I think really importantly is the impact and, and I think really one of the lessons for, uh, for us as a team and all of our managers is the impact of that personal connection. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've focused a lot on time. Um, I do a uh, Eight thirty call with the leadership team every morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's twenty minutes. It's mm. just quick chat, yeah. fantastic. A little bit of banter. What's going on? You know, everybody's got their own little routine, yep. but we're into it, and and the flow of information can happen really quickly. Everybody's got permission to say nothing. Yep. Yep. So there's no need to give mm. me the diatribe. It's yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. here's what you need to know. Here's you know, yep. or here's what I need help with. Whatever the story is. And it sets everything up. Yep. Right after that, I have a 30 minute meeting with my EA and the CFO. Yep. And that's a really casual check-in calendar, setting some things up for the day or for the week that we need to look at. But the role it plays is also connecting me, especially back to the EA and to the CFO in a casual, how we did, would have done anyway in the mm -hmm. office, yeah. in an ad hoc format, yeah. Yeah. you know, to and from the coffee machine, yeah, or the water, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, yep. you miss those when everybody's remote mm. and you forget about all the little things, mm. you know, thank goodness footy's coming back because we're going to have something to add to the conversation <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to pretend that I'm interested in reality television. <laughs> I can actually talk footy now, but um, that, 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 those things. So we've, we've really tried to push that down through the organization and encourage managers. Just yep. pick up the phone to your people. Yep. Connect. Talk. Mm. Uh, I remember, you know, it doesn't I remember have to work. a chat with you really early on. Um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the COVID period where you, where you uh, spoke about the fact that it, it's, it, you're amazed at how much we got out of the incidental contact mm -hmm. yeah. around the office yeah. and, and then how important it was for you to try and recreate that in some way, shape or form. Yeah, absolutely. You, just, you hear so much from people, yeah. especially things, and, and you've probably seen this, you probably actually <laughs> heard this from you know fellow players uh, or, or people you've coached where they tell you things they didn't actually intend to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, no. um, but you get those little extra pieces of, of, of information that can help you connect the dots and solving some other, other things. And maybe they're just not asking um, the, the right person at the right time, or it's your job is to put that together. So that's been a really, uh, interesting and key aspect of how we've tried to work with as a team yeah. um, and and tried to connect them and and the uh, um, the leadership team deserves a lot of credit we've had guys uh, on their own accord doing all sorts of uh, trivia calls yeah, yeah. drinks yeah. and you know yeah. and all these things just to keep everybody going and that's yeah. the the rallying point is 
you know, a, a few examples and everybody's run with it and they've created and compounded those things into so many other things that we've now uh, now created. And I think really, I think the culture will come back stronger yep. um, collectively when, when we do all come back. So we've spoken about the positives of COVID, mm -hmm. but there must have been some terrible days in there for it. <laughs> in there, mate. Like you, <clears throat> and a lot of it you wouldn't have been in your control either. <laughs> I suspect you've got head, head office in another country. Yeah. So therefore, so talk us through some of the, or even, you know, quite specifically the, the darkest moments of COVID <laughs> and, and how you got through it and how you felt and... Mm -hmm. Well, I think, look, the, the, the darkest was, was definitely the day we had to make the call on, on standing down employees. I mean, the, 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 the night before going to sleep, and I'm one of, mm. you know, two people that know that I'm going to be impacting the lives of the rest of the business. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't sleep, mm. you know, and then you, you come in, you sit in a meeting and the decision gets made. And then, you know, from that moment on that, that you're, you're past the point of no return. Um, when it's people, that it's very, very tough. And that, that for sure for me was the darkest um, moment. Um, and, and the team has done a remarkable job and the, the employees have, have carried on extraordinarily well, um, albeit in, in very tough mm -hmm. circumstances. And, and uh, I, I really hope that now we're through that and can uh, only continue to add back the hours and add yeah. back to the business. Um, but that certainly was the most How difficult. How many people most, were involved in that? Um, well, we had about 55 to 60% of the business in, in April and slightly less in, in May. And now we've basically got everybody kind of back and it's we're on sort of a, a reduced hours yeah, scheme exactly. just depending on what the type of role yeah. is and, and what your function is. So it definitely varies uh, by department and by team. Um, and then as you go through it, it was all the, you know, the, the, the learning mm -hmm. um, with everybody and reminding the, the challenge of everybody actually having to do all of the work now with such a reduced uh, group and then getting it through the rest of, of the machine of a, of a big multinational. And on a global basis, every country's doing things a little bit mm. differently. So we've been lucky that the uh, regional and global management has been very understanding of how we've been uh, managing it here. Um, but as I said, I think the Australian uh, recovery, um, yeah. at least at this point, certainly looks to be on a much better trajectory um, than most of the other places. So we're, we're really starting to see that voice and tone yeah. of optimism yeah, uh, sure. back into the group mm. and, and get people focused on the opportunity that, that will present itself um, going forward. What about your own personal brand? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's imp I say really, I talk to my boys about it a lot. They're only 23 and 25, but... Mm -hmm. Do you think we as leaders spend enough time, because we, we talk a lot about the team and trying to bring the team together, mm -hmm. but how important is to have your own personal brand and what you stand for as a human being? Sure. Um, I, I think maybe this will be a little bit controversial, but I don't think the, I think the word brand is is overused, yeah. like it's, it's, it's baubles and, yeah. and things, right? Yeah. I think it's really important what you touched on. What do you stand for? Yeah. Like, what are the things you yeah. do when nobody else is looking? Yeah. Mm, yeah. You know, do you live by that mm. code every single day? Can the people that work with you buy in to what you're doing? Yeah. Or is what you're saying lip service? Yeah. You know, and that, that is so critical. That, that Those are the moments of truth that I think we really understand who we are, but also who the others are around us and whether or not we really like that. And so for me, I say to people all the time, you do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Do what you say you're going to do. Even when it's bad news, even when it's no news, you always get it done. You always do what you say you're going to do. That builds trust and rapport with everybody else so that when you're giving good news, everybody says, okay, it's great news. And they don't think that something negative is going to happen next. But when it's bad news, you can also deliver it knowing that, well, it is, it is what it is. And at least, I know that you're going to follow through yeah. on, on whatever we're going to do. And that consistency, I think, is, is really what makes a difference and, and helps people believe um, in actually something. So that actions part is really critical for me. I think the important part, too, is just this notion of work-life balance. I always struggle with it. Like, to your point about brand, 
it, it's who you are as a person. It's not mm-hmm. who you are at work and then who you are at home. I mean, if you're a good person, if you have good values or whatever those values might be, yep. it's every minute of every day. Mm-hmm. I think that's the really important part. But I, I think too many leaders think they have to be something here and maybe different here. Yeah. Whereas my view is just be who you are, yep. learn and develop mm-hmm. and take on board different things. What what three words would you love people to describe you as if you were... Oh. <laughs> On your grave, son. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think um, uh, hardworking um, would certainly be one of those things yeah. in terms of, of getting uh, getting the job done. That's, that's certainly something that, um, you know, it was lucky growing up. I mean, uh, there was no sports outside and, until... Yep. Uh, I yeah, had the yeah, chores yeah. done and 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 things uh, were were completed. Yeah. Um, my uh, my parents were both uh, teachers and then principals of school, so I also had okay. from a, a, a work you standpoint. Had no chance. Oh, it was. <laughs> I mean, I've had the most harsh uh, uh, feedback on, <laughs> on my uh, my work growing up that you could ever imagine. But that um, that instilled that that hard work um, mentality um, uh, can do. It's something that we've embodied in our culture within within Nissan uh, Australia that I think is really critical because it 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 says that you're going to show up you're going to be optimistic yep. and you're going to try mm. no matter what yeah right and and even when the, the 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 chips are down or your back's against the wall you've got to come out swinging and and you've really got to try so those you know hard work um, can do and and generally speaking I think the last one is optimistic mm. okay you know I think you know, um, for sure, I want people to have trusted me or to think that I'm I'm honest and a good yeah. person. But I think, you know, optimism yeah. is sometimes something that, that we forget. And it, when you're looking at the news and it's just shattering what you see around the, the world, um, you right. know, in, in, at the moment in terms of what's going on. And uh, and, it, and that's a terrible thing yeah. because, you know, we have so much to be thankful for and, yeah. and, yeah, and appreciative mm. of. And I think if you're optimistic, you don't get so focused on the yeah. things you don't have, mm. you and know. What, and, and that's that's sort of the the bane of of most people's um, existence is always looking at, you know, oh, he has that, yeah, they've yeah, done yeah. this. Well, heck, you know, they worked hard yeah. for it. Grass is you know? always greener, hey? yeah. Mm. Um, and when when you reflect back over the last few months, mm-hmm. I ha- have you lived your values, your personal values? Do you think? And what have you learned about yourself in that period? Mm-hmm. Well, I think um, certainly I think I've lived my personal values because uh, I do my utmost to live those uh, every day. Yeah. Um, we certainly had a lot more um, work over the last little while um, in terms of a- adapting to the to the current circumstance. Um, and and as best as possible, we've been trying to inject optimism into into yeah. the story and in, into the narrative and yeah. not get caught up in in the moment. Um, I think as as far as learning, um, uh, helping others and letting go myself of trying to be the only one uh, okay. that can do things yeah. is is really clear. Mm. It, it's mm. it's it, it's it's important to I think um, uh, and and I've learned this is is that letting some of the other leaders be the leaders yep. and recessing myself um, has given people the opportunity to also step up and shine okay. in ways that they didn't necessarily think. And when you have a crisis, sometimes you think of the old view of there's one, you know, general at the front line or there's one person who's going to go. But the reality is that if that's the only way that you really act, everybody else just learns to just ask you questions and decide to do what you say you're going to do. Whereas, you know, and I loved what you said about bringing them along in the journey. Mm. If you step back and let them Create some space. Yep, okay. and and let them them go. As senior, we'll find that in even in crisis, it's not necessarily as much of a, yep. a challenge or a problem okay. that they uh, can't overcome. And so that's been, I think, a really uh, big thing for me from that standpoint. It's, it's a great thing, mate, because often, reason I often talk about this, when when the the heat comes on the most, that's often when leaders say, no, no, leave it to me. Yeah, you guys aren't up for this. So to hear. Mm-hmm. You say that it is fantastic because it, what it does do is it, it shows you're genuinely committed to empowering the team, growing the mm-hmm. team, and working working through the, the pressure with them. I think it's a great way to wrap mm-hmm. it up. And, and Steve, 
What we get asked frequently is, oh, you know, what companies do you work best <laughs> with? And, and our answer is always, it's not the companies, it's the leaders. <laughs> and I think what I've really enjoyed was the day that we spent together. Fortunately, we haven't spent too many more because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. But I think your, your analogy, I mean, about walking the walk. I mean, one of the things that I love is when I get to a workshop or I meet people and start talking to people, I think I can see the, the bullshit is in the group pretty quickly and you do walk the walk. Yeah. And I think that's been a real pleasure for, for Murph and I to to work with, with Nissan, to work with yourself. And we're certainly looking forward, Murph, to a continued relationship. A hundred percent. I think my final question to mm-hmm. the people on the couch where I can is, <laughs> what what advice would you give to a young Stephen Lester now now that looking back? Um, that's a good question. I think um, uh, probably the the advice that I would say to, to myself is is don't sweat the small stuff, and really focus on how you can persevere as as quickly as possible. I think sometimes we get caught up in looking to the future or looking mm. what others, and we're thinking that this is somehow a race um, that's got a, a finish line. Well, there, there's really no finish line. And even though you run into one yeah. hurdle, yeah, yeah, yeah. move yourself mm. around it, get mm. your yeah. blockers off, and 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 keep going through. And in in my you know younger years, I think I too often would uh, would get uh, bogged down in, in those uh, roadblocks and think I wasn't uh, progressing quick enough. And fortunately that, that kind of parted and a few things fell into, into place really quickly for me, which, which was very fortuitous. Um, but you could see how it could have not yeah. worked out that way. Yeah. I think, and, that, and that's the other thing is understanding that, you know, if it's, it's career or family or, or, or anything else, sport or whatever, or, you know, there's still a lot of luck involved yeah. and, and you've got to just seize those opportunities yeah. when they come up. Fantastic conversation, mate. Thanks hey, very pleasure. much, Steve. Murph, well done from you again. I thought you were a bit better today. I was a bit worried about the oh, last really? time. Thanks, but... mate. <laughs> no, thanks, Steve. Oh, we love feedback on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Great conversation, some incredible message, particularly through a really tough time, as we all know. But I think walking the walk, everyone can talk talk, but certainly Steve walks the walk. So thanks, Steve Lester, Managing Director, Nissan Australia, New Zealand. We'll see you next time on The Culture Couch. Mm-hmm.